Uh, on the back, I have a, um, a real basic outline of the book of Hebrews. Um, this isn't the only way to outline Hebrews. There's a lot of ways you could have done it. Uh, I just did it in a simple way to make it simpler for when you are reading the book through. Um, once again, when, when you read it through, you can outline it in your own way. There's no right way or wrong way to outline a book. It's just in whichever way helps you to kind of see what the flow is. So you can see throughout Hebrews, if you've got one of the sheets, if you don't, it's in the back, um, where it's, it's basically an argument as to how Jesus is superior to all the different uh, typical Jewish uh, things. The angels, Moses, uh, the high priest, the, the Levitical priesthood, uh, the laws of Moses. Uh, and, you know, it just kind of goes throughout, the, throughout that. And interspersed with that, showing that Jesus is better, is showing that the way of Jesus is better. So basically we have a greater promise. We have a greater hope. Going goes through all these different things. And in, in those argument, I guess you could say, are five different um, warning passages. I have not written them in this outline because I think that the warnings are given as more encouragement to not fall away. And as you read through the book, you'll see that he starts off encouraging them do this, keep going, and then he'll give a warning. Hey, and if you don't, th this is what this is the punishment that awaits us for when we turn back. And then he goes back to encouraging. So under that kind of idea, if you look at point number eight, it says encouragement to not fall away. That includes all of chapter ten, and then all of chapter eleven, where he's going to talk about the 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 Christians who have died that are or God's people that have died in the past that are our witnesses, are our witnesses. Uh, and that's the whole chapter. And so why is he t telling us about all these people who, you know, stayed faithful to God throughout the years? Well, because he's trying to encourage them to do the same uh, in the midst of their persecution. So uh, then besides that, uh, it kind of ends with um, moving it from more of a, I guess you could say theological slant, I guess, to more of an applicational slant at the end where he's just kind of saying, okay, so this is how it, you know, can apply to your life. Um, so I encourage you as you read through the book, look at that, see if it helps you at all. Um, that takes us to Hebrews chapter 1. Uh, I'll read verses 1 through 4 uh, right, right now, but before I go, I want you to understand that in Greek, verses 1 through 4 are a single um, thought. It's a single sentence. Uh, and they, all the parts of the sentences, which are called clauses, revolve around around one central clause, and that main central clause is God has spoken. So remember that everything in verse 4 revolves around the, the phrase God has spoken, okay? Uh, once again, in English, your, your English translations are going to have somewhere around two to four sentences, um, but in Greek it's not. It's just one kind of thing. So long ago, God spoke to our ancestors by the prophets at different times and in different ways. In these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son. God has appointed him heir of all things and made the universe through him. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact expression of his nature, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So he became superior to the angels just as the name he inherited is more excellent than theirs. So let's look at a couple things here. First off, as we go through the book of Hebrews, remember that the first generation of, of Christians, their Bible was the Old Testament. They didn't have the books of the New Testament yet. So remember that as we're going forward. Um, a lot of times Christians nowadays just don't even read the Old Testament. I think that's a huge mistake. That was their Bible before, you know, Matthew was written, and Mark, and Luke, and John, and all those. So, um, In verse 1, it says, Long ago, God spoke to our ancestors. Who he's talking about is the ancestors. He's talking about uh, Israelites' forefathers. That's um, just kind of the, the people before them. Um, so God spoke to our ancestors by, by the prophets at different times and in different ways. Now, when he's talking about the prophets, when we think of prophets, we think of the Old Testament prophets like Jeremiah and Isaiah and Ezekiel and Daniel and those guys. But when he's talking about the prophets, he's talking about all the writers of the Old Testament scriptures. All of them. The person who wrote Genesis, the person who wrote Lamentations, the people who wrote Psalms, the people who wrote 
uh, you know, all, all, all the different books, First Samuel and, and all of them, they're all classified by the first century church as prophets, which is kind of important because then it kind of brings up some more um, ideas there when it says at different times and in different ways. As you think about the Old Testament, you can think of a lot of different styles of, uh, of writing. So there's commands in the law, there's, there's poems, there's stories, there's visions and dreams, uh, there's uh, sometimes a, a voice is recorded specifically. So there's a lot of different things that are included in that different uh, times and in different ways. Um, if you'll remember um, previously, I don't remember exactly when I said it, but I mentioned about the way that um, the Bible was written over, where the Old Testament was written over the span of about a thousand years. That's it's a pretty pretty lengthy lengthy period of time. So when he talks about and in different times, that's what he's talking about. And so in that sense, a prophet is anyone through who God speaks through, um, as it's used here. Um, verse two takes us to where he says, "In these last days, he has spoken to us by his son." So first off, I want you to recognize that. The idea that are we in the last days, that's a modern question. For the New Testament church, there was never a doubt in their mind that we are in the last days. Uh, for instance, uh, one of the prophets, uh, maybe Joel, says, In the last days, your old men will prophesy and your young men will you know, have dreams and all that. I forget exactly how it's worded, but it's in Joel chapter 2, somewhere around there, 2, maybe 5 or something. And uh, when he's talking about that, he's talking about something that is saying in the last days the Spirit is going to be poured out. And then you get to Acts chapter 2, and Peter starts preaching in Jerusalem, and he quotes that same verse. And the idea is this is the last times. We are there. As soon as Jesus finishes his work, ascended back to the Father, then times began. And it's been a just getting closer and closer. So we are in what's described in the Bible as labor pains. That's why things get really, really bad, and then they kind of ease off for a little bit, then they get really, really bad, and if you look through history, that keeps happening more and more frequently. It's going to continue happening because we are in the labor pains uh, before the, the end end. So, um, yes, we are in the last days. Um, he has spoken to us by his son. Now, if you notice, this directly contrasts with verse 1. So verse 1, for instance, said, Long ago, God spoke to our answers. There's verse 2, it says, In these last days he has spoken spoken to us. Long ago, he did it by the prophets at many times in many ways, but now he has done it by his son. So there's a little bit of a contrast there. Um, and if you notice, he doesn't say that he, he spoke by the son's words. He says he spoke by the son. This is significant because um, what he's saying is it's not something that Jesus said specifically. It's everything about Jesus' incarnation. That was all God speaking. When Jesus came as a baby, when Jesus was, was in the temple as a small boy, when he, when he did preach, when he died, everything about his incarnation was God speaking uh, by the Son. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, the next thing I want to point out is that this passage also anticipates the end of revealed Scripture. If you've noticed, nothing's been added to the New Testament for 2,000 years. Um, that, was, that was not on accident. Um, there was, uh, we're getting to this some other time, but basically the only people who could write Scripture were called apostles. There aren't apostles anymore because they had to be with Jesus. There are other kinds of apostles, but once again, this whole argument, we're, that's another day. Moral of the story being that there's no longer uh, any scripture that is, that is being written, being revealed. There's nothing equal to the scripture, no matter how some prophet says, oh, I've got a word from God. It's still not equal to scripture. It's, it's under scripture. So uh, with that being said, uh, this anticipates the end of revealed scripture because it says there, he has spoken to us by his son. In other words, implying something that's not ongoing, something that is finished. And uh, so uh, definitely did anticipate that coming. He says here, God has appointed him heir of all things. Now, we'll get to this in just a second, but the idea is that Jesus was not always the heir. Okay, so put, put a pin in that. We will, we'll talk about that in just a second. But what an heir, let me say it like this. He is currently appointed as the heir, but if you look 
around in the world today, you might notice that we still have problems. So if he's been appointed as the heir, why is there still problems? And he's going to talk about this in chapter 2. But the basic idea is that Jesus hasn't received it yet. So he has been appointed. He has not... It, it, he's sitting at the right hand of the Father until the Father makes his enemies um, a footstool for him. So this is something that that's, we're going to talk about in chapter 2, but the idea is, yes, the place is assured. It's just the, the reality of it hasn't come to pass yet. So uh, kind of like your salvation. Are you saved or aren't you? Well, yeah, you're saved. So long as you continue the way, you can always choose to walk away from God if you want. You know what I mean? But when you get to heaven, that will be complete salvation. You can't fall away or anything. You're, you can't sin in heaven. So that's you know, one of those things. Okay, so, so this is what would be called, especially in the New Testament, an argument of um, already but not yet. And you'll see that a lot in Paul's writings, but once again, another day. Um, another way of saying it is that Jesus has been crowned, but things have not yet been subjected. So that's a good way of saying it too. Um, next up, he says, God has appointed him heir of all things and made the universe through him. So the whole Trinity was involved in the creation process. And think of it, th th these are kind of human terms, so don't press these terms too far. But the idea here is that uh, maybe you could say something along the lines of the Father is the mastermind, the Son is the one who did it. Another way you could say it, might be a little bit more accurate, is um, the father is the architect and the son is the construction worker. I mean, these are Im imperfect terms. But just to kind of give you the idea, God did it, but he did it through Jesus. So and maybe another way, way of saying that would be um, in Genesis when, it's, when, Jesus, well, when God says, uh, let there be light, and it was, that would be Jesus who was speaking. So if that helps. Okay, so then we go to verse 3, and it says, The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact expression of his nature, sustaining all things by his powerful word. And we'll have to kind of break this verse into two because it's a little bit too long to have it in big print um, on each slide. So first off, let's look at the idea of the sun is the radiance of God's glory. What does that mean? Well, think of it like the Father is the sun and Jesus is the rays from the sun. Um, he, Jesus is the radiance of God's glory, the um, expression of it, the, uh, the revelation of it. If that's kind of making sense. Um, we, we, this isn't really an idea that we have too much. So it's hard, hard to get words across for some theological concepts because we don't see it. So there's one God, three, three persons. Well, what in nature do we have that is that? Well, nothing, really. You can compare it to basic ideas like eggs. You know, you've got the shell and the white and the yolk. But that doesn't really fit because each of those parts would have to be completely and fully the egg. So you're a little bit limited with, with terms here, but the idea is that... And this is said in Scripture, and I believe I, I included in this. The Son, if you've seen the Son, you've seen the Father. That's a good way of saying it. Um... Yeah, so uh, he's the emanation of the Father's glory. Oh, I did include it. John 14, 9 says, Jesus said to him, the one who has seen me has seen the Father. He's the expression of the Father's glory. Uh, the next thing he says here, he says, the radiance of God's glory and the exact expression of his nature. What, what that means is think of when you have a coin and you make an impression. That, that's what it's saying. It's, he's the impression of the Father. Okay, so uh, more, another way of saying that would be that Jesus' nature is the same as the Father's nature. They are both fully and completely God. They just have different roles. Um, so they are both equally fully God. If you see the Son, you see the Father. They are, in, in their character, they are the same. Obviously, they are, they are, it would be wrong to say they are the same person because the Father did not die on the cross, right? You aren't filled with the Father. You're filled with the Holy Spirit. So, I mean, they do have different roles, but don't think of them as different, different gods. 
and don't think of them as the same God putting on a different mask. You've got one God in three persons or expressions, if you will. I don't know exactly know how you would. Once again, language isn't really made to uh, get that point across. We like to go to one or the other extreme. We say, okay, there's three gods, or we say there's one God, and he just kind of wears different masks at different times, and both of those ideas are wrong. So the Son is the radiance of God's glory, the exact expression of his nature, sustaining all things by his powerful word. Now, the idea here that we get with how this is worded is, do you guys remember uh, the story of Atlas, the guy with the, with, he's like carrying the world on his shoulders, do you guys remember that? That's the idea that we kind of get from this passage, but that's not what's being said in this passage. The idea is that as Jesus spoke in creation, creation is still sustained by his powerful word today, and it's going to its conclusion. In other words, Jesus doesn't have to keep speaking. You know what I mean? He doesn't have to keep um, arguing with the universe not to cave in on itself. The word that he spoke is a powerful word, and it's continuing it on to its uh, anticipated conclusion. So, uh, not like Atlas with the world, <laughs> not a constant struggle, but a command that is still continuing to its end. And the idea that I want you to get from that is that we don't have to worry about the world. We don't have to worry like the world worries about stuff. Um, especially if you turn on the news, everybody's freaking out from, there's always something or another thing. It's either World War Three or it's uh, a global vaccine, or not global vaccine, or a glo global pandemic, or it's this, that, or the other thing. They've always got something they're worried about. And you got a lot of people now worried about zombies. <laughs> uh, why don't we worry about, drag about vampires too? Huh? <laughs> but anyways, uh, the idea there being that, no, we don't have to worry about those things just because the world gets real worried about it. We don't have to look at the newspaper and let allow ourselves to get panicky. Uh, the earth will decay in God's timing as he decreed it. We don't have to worry about it. Um, but remember, all these statements that, we've, that we're looking at are connected. God has spoken. They, uh, Jesus and the Father are one, and he is sustaining it. It's one connected thought here. So then we go on from here to the second half of verse 3, and it says this. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So when it says after making purification for sins, and this is... Kind of, we're going to look at this more as the book goes along. The question being, was purification, when it says making purification for sins, for all sins or for all time? And the idea is yes. <laughs> all sins and all time. Um, past and future. And what that means is, is that when you sin, you don't lose your salvation every time that you sin. I know a lot of us we spend a lot of our life, you know, every single time we mess up, we think we have to have another altar call and get resaved all over again. Well, this is saying here, after making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. He doesn't have to keep dying for your sins over and over again. One time, for all sins and for all time. So when you mess up, you're still putting your faith in Christ the same as when you do good, right? You don't keep your salvation because, hey, I've been doing good, so that means Jesus doesn't have to forgive me, so we're on good terms, right? We do this all the time. We'll get stuck in any kind of a sin. You pick whatever sin you want. And then, oh, God, I'll never do it again. I'm so sorry. And then you do it again. Oh, oh, oh. Okay, well, this time I'll do it. This time I'll, I'll have it all. I'll do it. But the thing is, you're not relying on your perfection to never sin again. <laughs> you're relying on God's goodness because you are not perfect. And uh, so uh, hopefully that gives you a little bit of comfort there. Uh, the good thing about the book of Hebrews is it answers a lot of questions, um, giving us security in our salvation. A lot of times we kind of scare ourselves. Um, when has God done with me? When have I messed up too finally? And Hebrews has a lot to tell us about that. So um, how this works is people who died before Jesus came, how were they saved? They were saved by putting their trust in God. How are we saved? By putting our trust in God. So before, they looked forward to the coming Christ. Now we look backward to the coming Christ. What that means, and Hebrews is going to tell us later on, is that animal sacrifices never brought forgiveness of sins. They never brought forgiveness of sins, ever. What they did was they just kind of were a constant reminder of our need for salvation. Is <laughs> pretty much all that they did. But God took it as a symbol of faith. That's it. It's kind of like the, the circumcision thing, too. I mean, we don't have to be circumcised now. And all of the guys said, yes.
So a big concept that you see throughout Hebrews 1 through 4 is that Jesus is sustaining the universe, yes, but you see that he's also sustaining us in the universe. And as you read through the passage, you kind of see this, this very good thing about God being superior over it all, and then you can re- go into the rest of the book with that foundation of this is who Jesus is. And it says here, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So there's three things I want to point out from this part. First off, the sitting down. That doesn't mean that Jesus is no longer active in the world today. Okay? That doesn't mean that he is not our mediator. It doesn't mean any of that. All that, that means is that the work that he set out to do is done. He came and died for us, and then he sat down to show it's done. I don't have to do anything else. You trust in me, you're forgiven. Done. Um, and when he says here, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty, what that means, the right hand is kind of a sign of honor and favor. Um, so to show that Jesus had favor and that he did, did a good thing. Um, the Old Testament continually respond, uh, talks about the way that um, because the son loved righteousness, he was honored by God. So uh, then the next, last thing I want to point out about this voice, verse, this voice, he says, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Majesty on high is just kind of a reverent idea for God, um, the Father. Um, that, that, that's all that there is there. So now we're down at verse 4 then. And it says this, So he became, notice that term, very important term to notice, he became superior to the angels. Very important. Just as the name he inherited, implying that he didn't previously have it, is more excellent than theirs. So this is where we start opening a huge can of worms what in the world does that mean? How can he possibly be, be, need to become superior? I thought he already was superior. Now, hold on. That's one thing at a time, okay? Uh, first off, when it talks about how he, he just is the name he inherited, it's not talking about name like, hi, I'm Greg. It's talking about, like, um, honor, reputation. Um, in, in ancient thought, and somebody's name, name was more connected with their father's name. It was more connected with um, the deeds of that family. Um, so when you did something, it really brought shame or honor to your entire family household. Uh, so I would be like, of the, uh, I'd be like Michael of the line of Bob. <laughs> okay, so just kind of it carries that kind of idea to it. Um, so when it talks about how he inherited a name, he's talking about he inherited honor. He inherited um, a reputation. Uh, but it also is talking about the way that he inherited a couple of titles. And this is going to be absolutely clear in verse 5. We're not going to get to verse 5 tonight. But in verse 5 it says, um, I will make you my son and I will be your father. So some of the other things that it does imply is son. He was not the son before. He inherited that name. Okay, now you might say, now what do you mean by that? Hold on. <laughs> Let me get to that. Okay, I, I swear I'll make sense in just a minute. Uh, another name that he inherited is Savior. He was not previously Savior. Um, he was Warrior. Uh, he, er, he inherited a new name because he did a new thing. Um, and then the la- next thing he inherited would be Redeemer. Um, these are all kinds of ideas. Uh, so now let's, let's look at that kind of big, big question. What in the world does that mean that he became? What was Jesus before he became? How can he possibly inherit? Um, there is in orthodox, more orthodox Christian circles than the Sons of God, much more orthodox circles since we aren't really orthodox at all. <laughs> uh, there's something that they, that they hold to called the Nicene Creed. Um, maybe you've heard of it. Uh, if you have a, a background in, in more of the older uh, denominations, you're probably going to be aware of it at least. Um, and in that Nicene Creed, they, they, there's a statement that we believe in the Son and yada, 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 yada in the eternal generation uh, of the Son through the Father. And the idea here is that the God the Father is eternally begetting the Son. Um, it may be another word of saying, way of saying that is, well, what it literally means is the Father is eternally creating the Son, but that's not really a good term, creating. It's more of, um, there's no other way to really say it without confusing terms. Uh, the idea is that they're co-eternal because the Father is eternally 
begetting the son. So this is believed in a lot of Orthodox Christian circles. Um, I think that there's two problems with that. Um, I do not hold to the Nicene Creed. I don't believe that it is overly Christian. Um, the first thing is that it's impossible. Um, either God created the Son or he didn't create the Son. You can't have both. It's not like the Trinity where there's just like something we don't understand. That's just a straight-up contradiction. You can't. You can you're like, oh, Jesus is dead and he's alive. No, he's he's not dead. He he did die, but he is alive. Like you can't. It's not both and. It's either or. So that's my first complaint. And the second is that it contradicts the Bible. The Bible never once says that Jesus eternally beget, or that the Father eternally beget the Son. This is actually what it says. And this once again, we're not really looking at Hebrews one five. But we're just going to read it very quickly to kind of give some context to what I'm saying. It says this, Today I have become your father. This emphasizes a point in time when God the Father became the Son's father, and the Son became the Son. It, it's talking about a specific time. Today I have become this. Um, if this was something that was from eternity, he wouldn't have said, Today I have become this. He would have said, I am this. So that's the first kind of um, kind of thing there. And if you and if you pay attention to the story of of Jesus' birth, it makes sense. It really does. How was Jesus born of the Virgin Mary? Well, she was a virgin, so there's no intercourse involved. Um, sometimes in the newer age circles, like the kind of progressive Christianity, there's this idea of um, in in some variations of a spirit being having intercourse with Mary, and that's what it means when he, you know, foreshadowed her or whatever. No, 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 no. That's not what it's talking about at all, at all. Um, there's nothing dirty going on between uh, the Virgin Mary and God. That's completely bogus. The idea is that God created life where there was not life. Okay, I don't know if he used pre-existent material to do so, such as. Mary's eggs, or if he caused it to completely be from nothing, I don't know. It doesn't tell us. What we do know is that there's zero intercourse. The Holy Spirit came on her and caused growth, caused life. Okay, That's what it says. There's no intercourse. There's nothing even in the text to imply something sexual going on. <coughs> and so with that being said... That was a moment in time when Jesus became something that he wasn't before. He became the son. See, he wasn't born of a virgin before that point in time, so he couldn't have been called the son of God. See what I mean? It, ma it makes sense, doesn't it? Because he stepped down into history and became born of a human nature. So now let's kind of wrap some, stuff, uh, wrap some ideas together. He says, I have become, implying something before, He's talking about a specific, specific point in time when he wasn't. And then we have the, the record of Jesus being born of the Virgin Mary. And so we have he became the son. So a way of saying this idea, and just so you know, there is a large substantial branch of Christianity that does not believe in the eternal generation of the son. Okay? I'm not like pulling this out of thin air. There's, there, there's basically two opposing views, just like with predestination. Either we are predestined and we're not predestined. There's two opposing views. And you can be a Christian and believe by the or. Exactly the same is true of this. Um, there's a branch of Christianity that believes in eternal generation. There's a branch that does not. I do not. It doesn't make me unchristian. And if you choose to believe in the eternal generation, have at it. I'm just explaining why it seems to me like from, Hebrew, from at least Hebrews, if not to mention other biblical books, why that's not a thing. Remaining what he was, he being Jesus, he became what he wasn't. So Jesus didn't cease to be God. I know some people read Philippians and they think that that means that Jesus um, abandoned his godliness. That's not at all. At all. That's not, we'll talk about Philippians some other time. But when Jesus came to earth, he was fully God on earth. He never stopped being God. Okay, very important point. He didn't give up his godly nature. There's a lot of false teachers nowadays who are saying that the only reason why Jesus was able to do the works that he did was because of the Holy Spirit. So in other words, you can do exactly as Jesus. You are little Jesus. You are little God. And that's completely not accurate. We'll talk about that some other time too. 
Uh, but the idea here is that Jesus remained what he was, but he became what he wasn't. So before being Jesus, he was simply Yahweh. If you look at Mark chapter 1, it says this. He starts setting out, shoots off the book. There's no genealogy. There's no birth account. No nothing. He just goes straight into this quote of the book of Isaiah. And in that quote, it says, as is written in Isaiah, and I'm skipping a lot of it, prepare the way for the Lord. Well, the passage that he's quoting, when it says the Lord, the word used in Hebrew is Yahweh. The same Yahweh who spoke from the bush, the same Yahweh who led the people out of slavery in Egypt. It's the same, same guy. So the idea here being that, yes, who was Jesus before he was Jesus? He was still God. He was just known by a different name. He wasn't known as Savior then because he hadn't died on the cross yet. He, he wasn't known as Son yet. He's, he's never referred to as, as Son in the Old Testament, except for as the prophets talk about a, the coming Messiah, that's the only context where they ever talk about that. In, in the Old Testament itself, it never talks about him being the Son because he hadn't inherited that title yet, because he hadn't done that work yet. Um, so... Uh, then if you look at Jude chapter 4, verse 5, and it really depends what tr translation you use. Um, some translations say something along the lines of this. Denying Jesus Christ, our only master and Lord, the Lord saved the people out of Egypt, and he's talking about that same Lord Jesus Christ. And then a lot of the, old, a lot of the oldest manuscripts that we have of the book of Jude doesn't even say Lord, it just says Jesus. Denying Jesus Christ, our only master and Lord, Jesus saved the people out of Egypt. And either way, whichever word you think it is, it has the exact same meaning. Just one's more clear than the other. Jesus was Yahweh. It's the same, same name, same guy, doing the same things. Uh, so Jesus was God, but he became the Son. Um, so then that brings us, we're, we still haven't fully answered, um, we still haven't fully answered the question yet, because it said that he inherited something, he became something. So how is this, we still haven't fully answered this. We have in a sense that Jesus was God and he became a man, and man is lower than the angels, so he became lower, but then he was resurrected back to a place above the angels. Okay, so we still have that, but there's a little bit more to it. Didn't he already kind of deserve to inherit wasn't he already worthy? Well, yes, in a way, but also no. Um, let me kind of explain what I mean. He was fully God, yes. That's, that part's true. But, but the thing is, he couldn't claim the title of son or savior because he wasn't son or savior. He hadn't done that yet. And another way of saying this, and I think I have it on the screen. Yes, I do. Um, another way of saying that is that an unfulfilled promise is just a lie. If God said, hey, I'm going to bring you a Savior, and then he never gave that Savior, it would just be a lie. And Romans 3.26 says it exactly like this. God presented him, him being Jesus, to demonstrate his righteousness. And another translation says, Jesus came and died to prove his righteousness to us. He had to prove his righteousness is what it says. Now, why that? Because if he hadn't come and died on the cross, there would be no forgiveness for sins, and his promises would have been all and void because they wouldn't have been re realized. I'm going to give you $500, Terry. But then what if I never give it to her? Uh, I'm just a liar. I haven't really given her anything. God did it to prove his righteousness. I said that I would save you. I'm a good God, and I don't lie. So I will. So then he did. So he proved himself. In doing what only he could do, him, him and Jesus, he inherited what was due him. So uh, let's step back and kind of recap here. You have Jesus creating the creation. He's not part of the creation. He created the creation. And then from that, from the moment of creation, the Father and the Son already had their idea of what they were going to do. They already had it figured out. This wasn't like a, oh, last minute, what do we do? They messed up. They messed up the garden. What do we do now? They already knew. From that moment, they knew, okay, well, this is going to be my inheritance, and I'm going, to I'm going to be appointed as the heir once I go and die. So they let them do their thing, uh, them being us, and then he comes and dies, and now he's appointed heir. But he still hasn't received his inheritance yet because it's not that time yet. So I hope that this is kind of making sense. So in doing what only he could do, 
Jesus inherited what was due to him. Um, so then we kind of get to kind of another issue that is oftentimes raised in progressive Christianity more so than in, um, I'm going to say real Christianity, is the idea of, okay, if, if he is a son and we are also sons and daughters, doesn't that kind of mean that we deserve the same thing as him then? Aren't we kind of like equals then? <laughs> Some arguments sound real good if you don't really pay attention to all the scripture. So let's kind of break this apart little bit by little bit. And I have a chart here on the screen. It's going to kind of contrast the two. So Jesus is God. We are not. That's the first really big difference here. <laughs> we are not God. Uh, I know that there's a lot of uh, telev- television evangelists who talk about us being little gods. Um, I can't think of all of them. Uh, Joyce Meyer and um, uh, I believe Benny Hinn was another one. Uh, I want to say Bill Johnson. I don't remember all of them. I'm going to be real honest. I don't remember all of them. Moral of the story being a lot of these 12 angels are saying we are little gods because they take a verse from Psalm and kind of don't really understand it. And then they just say, hey, we're little gods. <laughs> not what's going on here at all. We are not God. Jesus is God. Um, absolutely that way. Uh, Jesus is a special, unique son. And we're going to look at that. It says that in Hebrews 11-ish, somewhere. Uh, and we are adopted. Um, he is the creator. We are the created. Uh, we do not become gods. Uh, uh, the righteousness that we have is his. The righteousness that he has is his own. Um, he was the original heir. He's the ruler. Um, we are co-heirs. He did make us co-heirs. However, we are still in subjection to him. Um, and that's something that, you know, obviously... So I hope that kind of clarifies the difference there. There's a lot of things different between uh, us and Jesus, but the long story being, no, we are not equal with him. Uh, in a little scene in heaven, Revelation makes this, tells us this, tells us a story, and it has Jesus um, as the Lamb, and they're saying, oh, who is worthy? Who can open the scroll? And it says, oh, there's no one, not a single person who's found who's able, not a single person. So that right there argues strongly that no. Just because we've been adopted in doesn't mean that we get to, you know, run the show. And then it says that, no, there, there's one, and it shows the Lamb, Jesus, the perfect uh, Passover sacrifice. And he is the one who uh, takes, the, uh, takes the role there. He's the one who's able to open it. So <clears throat> that brings us to the last of the questions that um, I'm going to look at in this section. Um, and who knew four little verses could have so many different <laughs> problems with them? <laughs> Well, uh, and the question being, well, hold on then. It, if Jesus, if Jesus is the Son, and he's subject to the Father, doesn't that mean that Jesus is less than the Father? Because he doesn't have an equal uh, title, if you want to say it like that. Well, <laughs> this is another one of those things that um, if you have a problem with authority, you're not going to get the authority of the Trinity. Okay, so if you have, for instance, if you have a bad relationship with your father, you're not going to understand God as the father. It's going to be really, really hard. You're going to um, argue back and forth and you're going to say, oh, he's just being a tyrant. And you're going to see him always, you know, looking over your back. But if you had a good, loving father relationship, you're going to look at the father a lot differently. And that's, that's the problem in our logic. We go by what we've experienced. And... Uh, that's not a very good thing to do uh, for obvious reasons. So here's the thing. Jesus and the Father, their character is the same. They are in complete agreement. There is zero, um, what's it called, um, antagonism, um, uh, vying for power, uh, uh, trying to prove themselves to one another. There's zero of that. There's zero competition. There's zero competition between the Father and Son. They're not at odds with one another. Um, but then, with that being said, yes, same nature, complete agreement, yes. They agreed from this, from the point of creation, there was no point where the Father had to rope the Son into it. They were in complete agreement. Um, Jesus talks about this quite a bit in the book of John, so I encourage you to read through that. Uh, but here's the thing. Um, Their roles are different. I think that's the best way I can say it. The Father and the Son do not share the same responsibilities. 
if that makes sense. So uh, when, when God died on the cross, who died on the cross? Well, the son did. Okay. That was, it wasn't the father's role. It wasn't the Holy Spirit's role. Okay. It was his role. Um, another thing is um, our relationships <laughs> are really scarred by sin in life. So we kind of assume things. And the Bible talks about the husband being the head of the house. And when, when we read that, nowadays with our broken culture, what we see is the husband is a, ty- is a tyrant abusing and mistreating his wife. Because that's what we know. We are fallen people, and so we think, okay, God must be the same thing. There must be some kind of antagonism between the father and the son because there's antagonism between husband and wife. And that's not really accurate. Um, let's see, how else could we kind of summarize this without dragging it out any longer than it already is? Uh, uh, Jesus is perfect, and he's not abusive of power, and neither is the Father. Uh, the Trinity has a structure. There's a, there's a way we could say it. The Trinity has a structure. And uh, when it says in Genesis that he, we are made in the image of God, it's not talking about the physical image since God doesn't have a physical body. It's talking about the nature and the character of the Trinity. And um, our, our, our society is built on that same structure that the Trinity is built on. It, he gave order to the creation. And we could go more about that, but the point being um, that they're not at odds here. There's, there's roles and structures. Uh, the next thing uh, is, and this is the last thing I, I want to point out about this, and we could really talk a lot more about this, but I don't want to. Uh, obedience doesn't make you any less. Jesus obeying the Father doesn't make him less than the Father. Okay? And with that being said, when Jesus obeyed the Father, he, once again, he didn't disagree with the Father. Okay? He tells us that whatever he sees the Father do, that's what he does. Whatever the Father says is what he's saying. They are in complete agreement with one another. That there's not a moment where they have, and that takes us to the whole thing that happened at the cross, where hey, if there's anything, any other way, that's a whole another conversation. But long story short, obedience doesn't make you any less. Um, yeah. So any questions on that? A little, a little complicated, and I don't really think I did a great job explaining it. But are there any questions about that? Kind of makes sense. So next week we'll start with Hebrews 1.4 and kind of give the summary of that. So if this was a little bit too much for you and you just kind of zoned out, don't worry. Next week we'll start out on verse 4 summarizing and we'll just go straight through the rest of the chapter um, and then probably actually get to chapter 2 next week.